right, let's get started. He did it. Yasha got tenure. And we're here to celebrate his achievement. Just a, a short introdu introduction about starting from the beginning. Yasha was born Victory Day, 1986, in Moscow, which was then the USSR. A, uh, a small and sickly child, Yasha was, was reading at age two, but only really speaking at age four. Uh, when the USSR collapsed, Yasha's family moved to Israel when he was four, and uh, by age eight, he had decided that uh, school was not for him. So for, by, <laughs> in age eight to nine, he did not leave the house uh, or go to school, uh, and was only convinced to start school again at uh, age 11, uh, where he started high school. Uh, and at age 12, he started college. And at this point, he, he through the help of a, a, a private uh, tutor and friend, he became interested in physics uh, and joined the Physics Olympiad. He was the youngest winner at the time of the uh, Asian uh, Physics Olympiad. Uh, here he is. <laughs> uh, and uh, then he, um, at, at, the, at, at this point, uh, became uh, somewhat of a celebrity in Israel uh, for being a, a child prodigy. Uh, so here's uh, in the, uh, uh, the paper uh, of record. Um, and he graduated with his first um, uh, bachelor's degree at age 17 uh, before he graduated high school. And this created a, a bit of a problem. Uh, he had to write an essay uh, so after, in order to graduate high school after graduating college. And the, the essay he chose to, to write was how the, Israeli, or the, the Hebrew translation of the Lord of the Rings was bad. And, <laughs> and uh, the word of this essay got to the translator, uh, who was a, a professor at the Hebrew University, who summoned Yasha to his office to say, what are you doing? How can you, 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 uh, you <laughs> object to my translation? And he, after, after uh, yelling at him for an hour, he offered him a, to do a PhD with him in literature. But Yasha said no, physics was for him. And so literature's loss is our gain. Uh, he, he then uh, joined the, the military and got his uh, PhD. Uh, a, and uh, at this point, uh, grew up, you know, a little bit. Um, met ya Rada at age 21, uh, married at 24, then moved to do uh, the, his first postdoc at Penn State in the U.S. Uh, in 2013. Uh, in 2015, moved to uh, do a second postdoc in the Perimeter Institute in Canada uh, before coming to OIST in 2017. And uh, in every one of his postdocs and uh, in now his faculty position, he had one wonderful child. Um, uh, I became uh, friends with Yasha after hearing one of his introductions to someone's talk, which is uh, very, uh, a combination of idiosyncratic, intelligent, kind of amusing, and slightly offensive. And I think this is really, this is really Yasha in a nutshell. Um, Yasha works on quantum gravity. Uh, this is a particularly esoteric branch of physics. And I think, I think this, uh, this esoteric nature of the, of the topic really attracts Yasha. Um, I would say the, uh, in our conversations, the 11th century Jewish philosopher, philosopher Maimonides comes up like way more when I'm talking to Yasha than I'm talking to my other friends. So uh, Yasha's uh, work um, uh, is basic research, right? So we, we hear a lot these days about tech transfer and academic industry collaborations and general applications. Yasha's work gives us none of these things. Uh, but I'm proud to be one of, the, uh, one of the, uh, the very few places that would celebrate someone like Yasha. Uh, some place that will celebrate someone pushing the boundaries of what humanity knows for, and, and, and getting knowledge for its own sake, uh, free of any uh, other gains. Uh, you know, you could ask, what's the point? Uh, but I think in a certain frame of mind, you could also ask, you know, what's the point of doing anything else? So, Yasha. Yeah, thank you, Sam. That was quite bad. <laughs> uh, all right.
right. Uh, can we uh, turn off the projector, please? Okay. So let's uh, talk about some physics. Now, the <coughs> most important thing in physics uh, is uh, the Pythagoras theorem. Uh, as it turns out, it took us uh, a while to figure that out. Uh, but uh, okay, so it's this. If you have a right-handed triangle, okay, then uh, there is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, uh, and it's like a prime example of uh, Greek science. Okay, and like it's really cool. Okay, uh, in case you've never uh, seen the nicest proof of the Pythagoras theorem, so uh, here it is, okay, the, the two uh, big squares are the same, uh, the little orange garbage uh, is uh, the same uh, in both ones, so uh, a squared plus b squared um, is in fact c squared. So uh, it's very nice, but uh, largely useless and doesn't seem to apply to anything uh, in the world. Like until you come and draw lines in the sand, okay, we don't have right-handed triangles uh, just uh, lying around. Okay, uh, and so it took 2,000 years for Greek science to develop into modern science, uh, which uh, takes things quite a bit more seriously. Uh, and I think this happened uh, through an injection uh, of uh, really Jewish uh, intellectual culture. And yeah, Maimonides is relevant to that. Um, because in Jewish culture, you see, in, in Greek science, this, is, this would be the domain of some uh, small number of nerds uh, who would care. In Jewish culture, everyone is a nerd. And by combining that with uh, the thinking of the Greeks, we got modern science that really managed to eat everything and to transform everything it touched. So in particular, it turned out that uh, the Pythagoras theorem is everywhere. And the way that happened is there was this guy called Descartes. And Descartes, uh, he imagined uh, little fairies Right, uh, flying around uh, everywhere in space and uh, sprinkling fairy dust uh, and, and painting with their fairy dust uh, this uh, uh, fairy dust grid that uh, you can see only if you're a little child and uh, you, you wear the fairy dust glasses. Okay, so there's a grid everywhere in space uh, and uh, to every point on the grid the fairies come and attach uh, a label uh, with uh, some numbers on it, right? So, uh, so every point has uh, numbers x, y, and actually the grid is in 3D space. Uh, so uh, there's also z, and okay, and here's another point, x, y, z. Okay, and and so for every line, okay, you must think, okay, just a line, but if you put on the fairy dust glasses and you can see the imaginary grid, then it turns out that for every line in the world, there is secretly um, a right angled triangle, okay? And the length of the line, okay, then uh, turns out to be, okay, the, the square, the square root uh, of uh, this, yeah? So uh, the difference in x, okay, which is this side, and the difference in y, which is that side, and uh, if there's also a bit of z, then we can add that in. Okay, so the Pythagoras theorem is actually telling us uh, the length of every line in the world. Well, okay, fine, smart guy, but how many straight lines does uh, the real world actually have in it? Right? The, the real world, last time I checked, uh, is, is made of uh, some, you know, floopy floopy uh, things like this. Okay, uh, how are you going to eat that? Well, okay. Uh, then came uh, another fellow uh, called Newton and came up with another bright idea, which is for every floopy floopy complicated thing, 
uh, we can chop it up into infinitely many little pieces like this, okay? And then every little piece is itself uh, a little bit of straight line, okay? So we can do the same thing as before, okay? We can say the, the length of this whole thing is, so for every little piece, okay, there will be some very little dx, and, and then to get the length of it, we'll do dx squared plus dy squared uh, plus dz squared, and take the square root, and that will be the length uh, of every little piece of line, and now we need to add them together, so we invent uh, a new fancy uh, symbol for adding things together, we call that an integral, okay? And now the Pythagoras theorem tells us the length of any line of any shape in the world. Okay, so that's uh, one achievement unlocked. Let's, uh, let's try to write that, so a squared plus b squared equals c squared leads to any length being an integral of uh, these things. Okay, and this is an example of uh, like the intricate relationship that we have in modern physics between like the, the real and uh, the concrete versus some imaginary worlds, right? So again, this grid does not exist. X, Y, and Z do not exist. The little dx's, dy's, and dz's do not exist. Okay, it's very easy to convince yourself of this if you're confused, because just show me the device that measures x. Okay, is there an x meter or is there a y meter? Uh, and like, there's not. Okay, you it, you can only see it if you believe in fairies. But there is a device for measuring length. Okay, it's called a ruler, and it just so happens that believing in fairies and uh, in their fairy dust X Y Zs uh, gives you a wonderfully convenient way to arrange all possible measurements uh, that you can make with the real world rulers. Okay, and that's a useful thing to have. Okay, so okay, a little example, in case you don't believe me yet that this is physics. So, so let's start talking a bit about optics. Okay, so optics is uh, about how light rays choose to travel through space. And choose through is a good word to use. So we can say, okay, there's a point A and uh, there's a point B. Okay, uh, what will be the path that light takes from uh, A to B? And it turns out that the universal law that governs the answer to this question uh, is that uh, the light will take the quickest path. Okay, this is called uh, Fermat's least time principle. Okay, so what is the quickest path? Okay, we can try drawing some paths, okay, and asking, ah, which one will be the shortest? But then, of course, the shortest one is actually the straight one, okay? Now, why is it the shortest one? Well, okay, well, we can uh, sprinkle some fairy dust and uh, decide that uh, this axis between the two points is called the x-axis, okay? And then, uh, for the length of the line, Okay, we have no choice but to travel along the x direction, so we will always pick up these dx's, but only if the line wiggles up and down, we will also pick up the dy's or uh, dz's. Okay, so the shortest path will be if we avoid uh, wiggling up and down uh, in any direction and uh, only keep the dx's, okay, so light travels in a straight line. All right, now that's maybe a bit too simple, but we can make it more interesting. So suppose there is a mirror, okay, and then light is trying to get from uh, point A to point B, uh, and the new rule is that it needs to touch the mirror first. Okay, so now, okay, you have 
all kinds of different paths to try. So we already sort of understand that the segments need to be straight uh, because anything else will be longer. Okay, but uh, there are these different possibilities uh, of uh, going in straight segments. Okay, and let's say if you if you go from one possibility to the other, then maybe the first segment uh, gets longer, but the second one gets shorter. Okay, so which is the shortest one overall? Okay, so there is a fun way of solving this problem, which is okay. We zoom in on on one segment uh, of the path and ask what happens when we okay, change the path a little bit. Okay, so this segment will get longer. Okay, by how much? Right. Let's uh, start giving names to things. Okay, so let's say the angle uh, between the, the light ray and the mirror is called theta. Okay, now by how much did the path become shorter? So, okay, by this much, okay, the two white lines are the same, the difference in length uh, is the little yellow bit. Now how much is the yellow bit? Okay, let's say that this uh, little dx here is uh, by how much we moved uh, the point. Okay, now let's uh, maybe draw this triangle a bit bigger. So there's a right-handed triangle like this, and this is the dx, and this is the same theta as here. Okay, so the amount by which uh, the segment got shorter, got longer, uh, is okay, dx here times cosine of theta. Okay, now we can repeat the same exercise uh, for the second part of the segment, right? Where, okay, if this one got longer, then this one uh, will get shorter, and Okay, but from moving by the same dx, okay, except now there will be some uh, different angle here, theta 2, and this one was maybe theta 1. Okay, so, uh, so the amount we lose by moving the point a little bit is uh, dx times cosine of theta 1. The amount we win is uh, dx times cosine of theta 2. Okay, and uh, the the optimal point okay, will be the one where uh, we don't win or lose much by moving in uh, either direction, right? So if it's uh, a good idea to uh, to move to the left, okay, well that means that this shortening is bigger than uh, this lengthening. If it's uh, a good idea to move to the right, that means it's uh, the other way around. Okay, if we are at uh, exactly the right point, so we shouldn't really move uh, either way away from it, okay, so that means the length shouldn't really change when we uh, move by a little dx here. Okay, so that means uh, these should be equal. Okay, so uh, we get that when light is reflected uh, off a mirror, okay, it uh, does it at uh, equal angles. Okay, something like this. Okay, that's still maybe a bit too easy. So let's make it harder again. Now, we said quickest path. Okay, didn't say shortest. And normally you would say, what's the difference? Quickest, shortest, uh, light always travels at the same speed. There's a speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. So okay, shortest is uh, good enough as a proxy. Uh, but uh, sometimes the world is dirty and full of all kinds of uh, materials, okay? uh, like water or glass or I don't know what. And inside materials, uh, light can have a different speed. Okay? Uh, so when light moves uh, slower, uh, in the material, okay, we uh, call that 
uh, a refraction coefficient. Okay, and uh, okay, label it by the letter n. Okay, so, so so actually the the time that it takes light to move from place to place, what we're trying to minimize is now mm, not just the length. Okay, but when we're moving slower uh, in some portion of the path, okay, then we also need to uh, multiply uh, by this refraction coefficient. Okay, so now what happens uh, when light is trying to get uh, from A to B, okay, and the refraction coefficient uh, is, uh, let's say, higher here, uh, and lower here, okay? So that means here we're moving slower, so we want to spend less of our uh, path uh, here in the slow region and more of our path in the fast region, okay? So probably the quickest okay, route will be something like this, okay? And that is indeed what happened to light rays when we, they move from medium to medium, they get refracted like so, okay? But uh, by how much? So, okay, we can play the same game as before. Let's say uh, here there is uh, an angle theta one, here there is uh, an angle theta two, okay, and the fraction coefficients are n one and n two, okay? And we can uh, play the same game as before, right? So we need to choose at which point uh, the light ray should switch between the materials, so we choose it by trying to wiggle it a bit to the right or to the left and see by how much uh, the length of the path and then the, the time uh, it takes to travel changes. Okay, do the same little calculation as here. Okay, exactly the same triangles, the same uh, cosine theta and cosine theta, uh, except now uh, on both sides, uh, we need to uh, multiply the length of the path by uh, how long uh, it will take to travel along it, so so we need to like, multiply by the ends here on both sides. Okay, so the angles are no longer equal, and the way to figure out how unequal is that, uh, well, okay, we only the dx cancels now, so, so n cosine theta is uh, n cosine theta on the other side, okay, and this is Snell's law of refraction. Now, okay, this uh, happens every time we move from uh, high to low refraction coefficient. Okay, uh, we can think of that happening continuously. So, suppose there's some uh, direction uh, in which uh, the refraction coefficient decreases. Okay, and now suppose we shoot uh, a light ray Okay, a little bit up, like this. Okay, then what will start happening to it? It will start bending, like this, uh, b continuously throughout its flight. So, so it will bend, 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 bend. At some point, it will bend all the way horizontally and start uh, falling back down. Okay, that uh, sounds suspiciously like it's actually a ball falling under the influence of gravity, and we will soon see that it's quite similar. Okay, but, right, this is uh, what will happen. Okay, uh, uh, a quick way uh, to see, okay, what is going on here is, okay, we write again the, okay, Pythagoras, uh, multiplied by n, okay, so now if we're trying to get from point A to point B, then we would think, okay, that it would be cheapest to just go uh, only along x without paying this extra penal penalty of going up and down uh, in y, okay, but because n is smaller uh, if we go higher up, then it becomes worth our time Okay, to pay in uh, uh, dy's uh, in order to get to a region uh, of uh, small n where uh, we move faster. Okay, so 
path becomes something like this. Okay. Uh, this turns out to be uh, very relevant uh, to the real world. Okay. So uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, um, the higher layers, the ionosphere, uh, have a low refraction coefficient for radio waves. So when people started using wireless communication uh, and uh, tried to see if they can use it over long distances, uh, where the curvature of the Earth becomes important, they had a pleasant surprise. Okay, so you would think that because the Earth is round, then okay, if you shoot a radio signal, say from here to here, uh, you'll never manage, okay, because it would just fly off into space. Uh, okay. Uh, possibly this is one of the arguments of flat earthers. I don't know if it really is. Um, but uh, what turns out to happen in the real world uh, is that uh, the refraction coefficient behaves like this. So, uh, so the radio waves uh, actually bounce back down uh, like so. Uh, and so wireless telegraph across continents uh, worked much better than uh, people expected. Okay. So... We're making good time. We understood all of optics. Okay, uh, so let's call it uh, minimal time. Leads to okay. The hardest part of optics is uh, n cosine equals n cosine. All right. Okay. Now let's uh, briefly discuss tenure. So, okay, S Sam was wrong in almost every particular fact, um, but, I mean, he's a biologist. Um, but uh, it is more or less true that, uh, yeah, in 2003, uh, I went to the physics Olympiad, and uh, as part of the preparation for the physics Olympiad, uh, a good friend uh, explained Maxwell's equations. And from due to a combination of these two things, uh, I decided that uh, I want to be you know, a world-traveling scientist and uh, specifically uh, to do fundamental theoretical physics. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, and I want to be a Hollywood actor. Great. Um, okay. Uh, uh, for some reason, uh, this actually managed to happen and kind of get secured uh, 20 years later. Now, what is important to point out uh, is that uh, left to my own devices, okay, uh, I uh, would have made it. Now, I wasn't too dumb, so I made it more or less 10 years um, by my own resources, right? So uh, during this time, I did the physics undergrad, uh, did the army, did PhD, uh, got a strange uh, first postdoc. Uh, but uh, from then on, I would basically need to find a real job, and um, that was it. Now, the strange thing that happened is that somewhere in the middle uh, of uh, this interval here, okay, uh, I met this absolutely amazing girl, uh, like that one, I guess, uh, who uh, has, you know, talent for making things happen. Yeah, so very routinely, you know, she takes uh, problems that look you know, far too complex, like, the academic job market, or like situations that look far too hopeless, like, oh, here's this idiot who decided that he wants to do fundamental theory for a living, and he doesn't want to be friends with these people, and he doesn't want to be friends with those people, and he keeps calling everyone names, and how the hell is that going to work out, right? Uh, but, you know, when she sees a, a complicated problem, uh, she figures out how to make it work. So, and she can solve things 
before anyone can even put a name to them. Uh, and she can clean up messes before anyone will admit that there was a mess uh, or that they made it. Uh, and she can generally science the shit out of very complex situations. Uh, all right, and, and for some reason she decided uh, that uh, her project uh, for the time being uh, is going to be to make my stupid dream come true. Okay, uh, I wasn't the only project that was competing for her attention. Okay, uh, so somewhere uh, around this time uh, she got an uh, uh, invitation from the institute of which this institute is an imitation. Uh, to come and go to grad school there to solve their problems. An invitation must be stressed. She did not apply, they called her. Uh, and she said, no, you know, I found this idiot and this, he has this dream and I'm gonna make that work and we will talk later. Um, and, uh, and so it kind of happened. Okay, so, uh, Right, so at this point uh, we're uh, in uh, America, and okay, Itai gets born low Itai, and then because uh, Rada exists and can make things happen, we then find ourselves in Perimeter Institute in Canada, and Gali gets born hello Gali. Uh, and then again, because Rada knows how to make things happen, uh, we uh, find ourselves uh, here, and uh, I somehow survive uh, being here, where again, because Rada knows how to make that happen. Uh, so, okay, and now I, I should, uh, I guess, carefully point out because uh, the this project is uh, largely done, uh, her attention is again divided. Uh, and uh, so uh, just uh, to bring it to your attention, if something near you is working, and Radha is somewhere in the vicinity, please take very seriously the possibility that she is the reason it's working. Even if you're too stupid to understand exactly why in the moment. Just sit quietly and consider the possibility. Okay. Uh, back to physics. So, <coughs> X, Y, and Z, Okay, we're fairy dust. Okay, we uh, just invented them, sprinkled them uh, over the space. Uh, adults can't see them, all the children with the special glasses can. But surely this timeline that I drew here, that's not fairy dust, that is real. X, Y, and Z are fake and made up, but T, <laughs> T is a real axis, right? Because there is no device for measuring X, Y, and Z, but there is a device for measuring T, right? There, there is a clock. We can look at the clock and see, oh, it's 2003. Oh, it's 2023. And two people comparing clocks will always see the same thing, and that's how we know that T is real and not made up, right? Well, not exactly right. So it turns out that uh, you know if uh, you take uh, okay people like doing this with twins, but uh, you know fine unethical experiment. You you take two twins, and uh, and one of them uh, stays on Earth, and uh, the other does uh, a round an interstellar round trip, you know uh, fast uh, close to the speed of light. Uh, the Ender's Game uh, sci-fi series is pretty good at accurately depicting this situation, uh, if you want it in story form. Uh, then, okay, then they come back and they compare uh, their clocks, and this guy's clock, the one who stayed, might say that it's been a hundred years, uh, and uh, the guy who went uh, there and back again, his clock might say that it's been one year. And of course, not the clock that nobody wears on their wrist anymore, and not only these new clocks that we keep in our pockets, 
but also the biological clock, right? So, so this guy will be old, and uh, this guy will be young, and every sense of clock that there is, okay, uh, we'll, we'll say that uh, okay, something different uh, happened here, and therefore clocks do not measure T. Okay, uh, T is an imaginary label that uh, we put on events, on points in space-time, just like X, Y, and Z are. So, so there is an imaginary fairy dust grid uh, of both T, X, Y, and Z, and there is not a device that measures any of them. But we do have clocks. Now, what on earth do clocks measure? So it turns out this is the great uh, victory of Pythagoras from beyond the grave, that what clocks measure, what we should call clock time, or if you want to be fancy uh, or fancy full, we can uh, talk about the clock inside our brain and uh, call it uh, experienced time. You know, how old the twin is going to live, is going to feel. feel. Right? Any kind of actual true physical time, okay, the physicist's name for it is proper time. And uh, we denote it by the letter tau. Okay, so for a while, this was kind of a class filter. Right? You, you couldn't submit uh, papers about relativity uh, into journals if you only had a typewriter with the regular letters and you couldn't write the letter tau. You would write T and they, think that they would think that you're stupid. Uh, this uh, actually happened to a good person once. So, okay, so this proper time tau is given by, okay, we already know, it should be a sum of uh, lots of uh, uh, tiny things and we already know that uh, there should be something like dt here because you know, in our normal life, it does seem like uh, the t coordinate uh, is in fact measuring the same thing as uh, clocks are. Uh, but also, okay, we see that if you travel in space, if you travel in uh, x, y, z, uh, then uh, your clock time turns out to be shorter than uh, someone who doesn't. And there is a formula for this, which is utterly astonishing. So, so it turns out that we take exactly the same thing that we had in the Pythagoras theorem before, and you just put it here, uh, and, and you slap it on with a minus sign. Okay? Or like, if, you, if you like, uh, we can just ditch the parentheses and uh, write minus three times. Okay, so this is uh, Pythagoras' theorem for uh, space-time, and this is the thing that uh, clocks really measure. Okay? Uh, we have thus learned special relativity. Okay? Uh, honest to goodness, this is all that special relativity is. Uh, the rest is, uh, uh, you know, not Rabbi Lel himself, but somebody. Uh, would uh, uh, comment here that the rest is commentary. Uh, right? So special relativity is um, an activity uh, centered around uh, the worship of this formula uh, and uh, understanding its implications. And there are many. Okay, so okay, we learned special relativity. Let's. Uh, Write it here that clock time uh, is this uh, four dimensional Pythagoras theorem with minuses. Okay. Uh, in particular, the, the difference between space and time, you know, the fact that there's one dimension of time and three dimensions of space, and that uh, a clock and the ruler are such different physical objects. Uh, is and that, that you cannot go backwards in time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, is uh, all uh, hiding uh, here in these uh, minuses. Okay, but <coughs> we can 
uh, also immediately uh, take this uh, formula and apply it into a law. Okay, so so in the in the story of the two twins, okay, or the one of them uh, who stayed and uh, and the other uh, who flew. So this is uh, uh, this is called sometimes the twins paradox. Okay, the reason people call it a paradox is they make it out to be, oh look, they were the same. You know, this one was doing one thing and this one was doing a similar thing, and then they compared the clocks and the, the clocks didn't agree. Paradox. Okay, but that's of course silly. Uh, they were not uh, doing uh, the same thing at all. Okay, one of them. Uh, was uh, dutifully staying put, uh, and uh, the other uh, was uh, working a rocket engine. Okay, so we don't need to draw the Earth here at all. We can just okay. This guy is here hovering uh, in space, uh, doing nothing, just quietly obeying the laws of physics. Okay, so this is. Uh, He's doing inertial motion, just doing what he's told. Okay, uh, while uh, the other guy is uh, you know, working hard and uh, burning uh, jet fuel, uh, etc. So, so we can uh, now write down uh, the law uh, of uh, inertial motion. So just as the central law of optics uh, is that uh, light will take whatever path uh, that uh, would take it minimal time. So here it's a similar but uh, like delightfully backwards version that if you travel from point A to point B in space time, right? So, so this is at some time and some place, and this is at some other time and some other place, okay, then you can take different paths uh, between these uh, two points. And the one that uh, you'll take, if moving inertially, if not uh, cheating, if not using jet fuel, if not using any forces, uh, will be the path of maximal uh, clock time. Okay, so if you're just, if we draw the time axis to go straight between the two points, then the longest way to get from here to there, okay, the, the oldest that you can be uh, when meeting your twin is if you stay put. Okay, because if you wiggle uh, back and forth in space, if you turn on your jetpack and uh, start flying to the stars and doing uh, silly things like that, uh, then uh, you will pay here uh, with the negative signs, okay? So the time on your clock will get shorter, okay? Uh, so the path that uh, you follow without any forces acting on you uh, is the uh, path of maximal clock time. So, in other words, uh, you know, the universe is just trying to spend more time with you uh, as you uh, go from point A to point B, uh, and uh, all of your efforts uh, are uh, just uh, working against that. Okay. So, now, okay, what does all this have to do with gravity? Right? Uh, so, you know, I working here uh, for a while, and uh, uh, because I got here early enough in the life of the institute, uh, I got to uh, be really shameless and uh, uh, call my group uh, ah, the quantum gravity, uh, blah blah. And then everybody else who came later had to invent some uh, longer and more uh, convoluted names, um, and. Uh, uh, because of this, uh, people uh, keep coming to me and uh, asking uh, basic questions. Okay? And for some reason, nobody asks uh, what is quantum mechanics. 
uh, maybe they go to Thomas for that or whatever. Um, but uh, they keep coming and asking what is gravity. So, okay, so that is the main idea of this talk. Uh, to <coughs> give some sort of explanation of what gravity is uh, in our modern view of the world. So the statement is that that motion uh, under gravity, uh, under the so-called gravitational force, is described by exactly the same law as motion without any forces at all. Kay. So the time on your clock when traveling from point A to point B is trying to be maximal. Gravity just wants to spend more time with you. Um, now, okay, then why, why does it seem like it's pulling us places and uh, Okay, why uh, is there such a thing called gravity at all? Well, what it does is it hacks uh, into the formula that relates uh, is the fairy dust coordinates, uh, T, X, Y, Z, uh, to the clock time tau. So uh, just as uh, if your light trying to go through the through a material, so there would be some refraction coefficient sitting uh, in front here. But gravity is more subtle than that. So it goes inside uh, the square root. And what it does is, so let's, uh, let's keep uh, dx squared, dy squared, and dz squared where they are for a second. <coughs> And the dt squared, okay, it puts a coefficient in front. Okay, so it's not just one as uh, here, but uh, one plus something. Okay, uh, this something. Uh, turns out to be uh, up to a little factor of two, uh, uh, exactly the same. That uh, exactly the same thing that in Newtonian mechanics uh, we call uh, the gravitational potential. Okay, so okay, so we have this kind of uh, deformed coefficient <coughs> in front of the dt squared, and Okay, let's uh, leave the others be for a second. Okay, so what does that do? Okay, so we have uh, our uh, surface of the Earth, say, and uh, okay, uh, as you go up, okay, there is uh, an uh, increasing gravitational potential. Okay, we're climbing up the uh, Earth's uh, potential well. So uh, in this direction, there's uh, an Increasing phi, okay. and okay. And suppose we want to go uh, to get from some uh, point A to point B. Okay. So the longest path uh, without gravity, if it were uh, just uh, like this, uh, would be just to go uh, in a <coughs> straight line. Okay, so suppose, uh, okay, let's, let's draw the t-axis here. Okay, so the longest path is to, to go just along t and uh, not pick up uh, any of these minuses. Okay, and, uh, okay, and this is height. Okay. But uh, once we start messing uh, with uh, the formula for the clock time, then, okay, then the, the path wants to go through the, like, the higher regions because time okay, ticks faster there. Okay, and then uh, it has choices to make. Okay, so uh, it wins some longer time by uh, traveling up, okay, but uh, it pays a price okay, from the minus uh, dz squared. 
Okay, and there's some kind of balance between the two. Okay, and uh, it will uh, end up a taking a trajectory like this one, so shooting up and uh, then uh, falling back down. Okay. And this is what the gravitational force is. Okay. Uh, I think nobody really says that. They don't see it in high school, they don't see it in undergrad, they don't really say it ever. Um, but this is what it is. So, so they teach you about the gravitational force, like Newton uh, would talk about it. Then sometime much later, they maybe teach you general relativity. Um, and then they mention as you know, one of the uh, physical effects, one of the let's say, experimental successes of general relativity that we can do is, yeah, we can take an atomic clock. Okay, put one on Earth, uh, put one uh, on uh, an airplane or on a space station, uh, and uh, compare them, and find that yes, uh, clock tick, the clocks stick uh, more uh, when they're uh, high up than uh, when uh, they are uh, down here. Okay, and we call that uh, gravitational time dilation. Right, but. Uh, the, the cool point is that this effect is the entirety of the gravitational force uh, that uh, we are used to. Okay? So the universe uh, is trying to spend as much time with you as possible. Okay? Uh, gravity uh, deforms the notion of uh, how much time you're spending with the universe, okay? and you just respond uh, by uh, uh, choosing uh, a new uh, maximal time path. Okay, uh, so we learned general relativity. Well, kind of. Uh, we learned motion in general relativity. So that is exactly the same as special relativity, uh, except uh, there's uh, something else here in front of the dt squared and uh, minus the stuff from before. Okay. Now, uh, let's, okay, this is the entirety of uh, the gravitational force that Newton uh, knew about, okay? That uh, ev everything that is about, you know, apples and the orbit of the moon and the orbit of the planets and uh, what happens to you when uh, you fall off a 20-story building. But uh, that's not all that uh, gravity in its modern formulation in uh, general relativity knows how to do, because this is only one term inside the square root. If we're messing with one, we really should mess with all of them. So, so generally, okay, there can be a lot in here. So, so we talked about uh, the coefficient in front of uh, dt squared, because it's dt squared, uh, we, we call it like this, with a g with a tt, okay? And uh, we can also change the coefficient uh, if in front of uh, dx squared, and we can change the coefficient uh, in front of dy squared. Uh, and it quickly turns out that if you're already doing this, then you also need to allow yourself to uh, mix them together. So there's going to be an x, y, like this, and uh, like, uh, maybe a y, z. Okay, so, uh, so a bunch of uh, terms inside the square root. Okay. And uh, because uh, theorists are lazy people, we take all this, uh, and uh, we package it in fancy notation. So we say, yeah, there's a square root, but now there's this uh, matrix of uh, coefficients right, that uh, multiplies okay, uh, displacements along some axis and some other axis. So we invent a little letter mu 
uh, in honor uh, of uh, the great Minkowski, uh, who uh, understood this whole picture of what space-time is, and uh, mu, which is the next letter after mu, and okay, g mu nu here, uh, with the, the convention, which is maybe Einstein's greatest contribution to mankind, uh, that, uh, okay, we sum over uh, all the choices of axes here, so, so this like, literally means all of this uh, sum here. Okay, so now the hacked clock formula uh, is uh, written in its uh, full glory. Okay, now people can uh, come and say, nah, this, this, is, this is too complicated. <laughs> Uh, we, we don't know how to multiply and, and take squares, and then you're telling us we need to take a square root in the end. Look, if you wanted a force, if you wanted to change the balance uh, of uh, longest time uh, from point to point, surely there is an easier way to tamper with the formula than going and inventing coefficients inside the square root. We can just do some good old-fashioned uh, bias. Yeah, so, so let's just uh, you know, say that, okay, we, we want to, to keep maximal what? Hey, there's time on the clock, which is uh, dt squared uh, minus all these things. But uh, we're going to cheat, and uh, we're going to say, oh, by the way, and if you, if you move uh, too much in the uh, t direction, you're going to pay for that uh, some amount. Some coefficient, no, let's call it a t. And, and if you're going to move in the x direction, okay, you're going to pay some amount for that. Okay, is, isn't that simpler? Okay, just uh, instead of maximizing uh, the time on the clock, okay, uh, you okay, in, in introduce uh, some extra thing that's uh, that's added on top of the clock simply without squares, without square roots. Uh, just you know, pay a price for every little motion along t, pay a price for every little motion along x, and uh, and that's done. There you have a force. Okay, people, uh, things won't be moving along boring straight lines now. Okay, wonderful. Uh, it turns out that uh, the universe does actually do this as well, uh, and that this idea is nothing but the modern picture uh, of uh, what electromagnetism is. Okay, uh, so, so, so yes, yeah, so the simplest way uh, to add something on top of just uh, maximal time turns out to invent electromagnetism. So, so here we are here, so, so now the, the maximal thing uh, is going to be uh, not just uh, clock time, uh, but uh, shifted by, uh, this is still a good trick, packing up uh, many terms in uh, one little formula, so, so there's going to be coefficients along some axes uh, times uh, displacements uh, along those axes, and, and this is electromagnetism. Okay, uh, in particular, this little uh, thing here, a mu, uh, is called uh, the electromagnetic potential. Okay. Historically, uh, here this uh, price we pay for. Uh, uh, moving along the uh, t-axis uh, is called the electric potential, and it is uh, responsible for for all the phenomena of electrostatics. 
okay, of uh, you know, capacitors and sparks and lightning and uh, you know, your hair getting spiky when you uh, rub balloons uh, against each other and so on. Um, and uh, these uh, other terms in front of x, y, and z uh, are uh, called the magnetic potential, and they're responsible for uh, all the phenomena of magnetism uh, and uh, all the complicated ways in which the two interact that uh, results in objects like electric generators and washing machines. <coughs> um, and now, important uh, historical note uh, is that, of course, generators and washing machines, uh, the electricity and magnetism uh, were figured out before uh, all the rest of this uh, story. And not only figured out before, but they uh, led to it. Okay? So this is a slightly uh, modernized notation. I don't think anyone in the 19th century uh, would have uh, written it like that. but. But they noticed that uh, there is some funny way in which the t-axis behaves just like the x, y, and z axes, and it makes sense to package them all together uh, into one beast uh, like this. And, and from figuring out the, the consequences of uh, you know, what that would entail, hey, uh, we ended up with uh, the four-dimensional uh, Pythagoras with uh, and the Feinstein's understanding of what uh, a clock uh, really measures and uh, ultimately uh, with the, the picture of uh, gravity uh, as uh, hacked into clocks. Okay, uh, philosophical little bit to finish. So we already draw twice a uh, picture like this, uh, once for uh, refraction of uh, light rays, once for gravity itself. Uh, it's worth noting that there are two opposite ways of uh, viewing this picture. So if we if we zoom in on uh, every little portion of it, okay, then it looks like a uh, okay, ball is uh, flying up, and uh, along comes the evil universe uh, with its nasty tendency to maximize clock time, and it's pulling the poor thing back down. It tries to go up, but it comes back down. Okay? But that is not the fundamental way in which the law is written. Okay? This is the best formulation of the law. The universe wants to spend as much time with you as it can. And this version of the law, what grown-ups call the action principle, is not talking about any kind of downwards force that is pulling you when you're trying to fly up. No, no, no. It just says maximize this. Maximize this when trying to go from A to B. Now, when you zoom out and look at uh, the global picture like that, then it begins to seem that you actually got gravity all wrong. Um, because without gravity, the shortest path uh, from uh, A to B is just the horizontal line. Uh, but because okay, clocks run faster uh, up here, what gravity does is it takes that line and it pulls it up okay, and uh, shows uh, the way to where we belong, to the stars. Uh, now, I'm uh, too sick to do the last bit, so I'm just not going to do it. Just follow the link in the email. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>
that was pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> if, there's, if there's no questions, I'd like to thank all the people that uh, have uh, made this possible. So the CPR for the filming and the advertisement, the, uh, the provost office for putting this together, and the machine shop for making this special gift, which reads, Dear Yasha, your tenure, marking you as a colossus in academia, radiates extraordinary brilliance and indomitable spirit, profoundly inspiring our collective journey in knowledge. We thank you. <laughs>